Hello, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us for our, our second Lipid Maps webinar, part, of a, a, part two of a sphingolipidomic series, which will be presented live from Georgia Tech by Professor Al Merrill. Al is the Smith Gall Institute Chair of Molecular Cell Biology in the School of Biological Sciences and the Pettit Institute for Bioengineering and Biosciences at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is uh, Valerie O'Donnell. I'm Director of Division of Infection and Immunity at Cardiff University in the UK and I'm introducing Al again today. So two weeks ago, those of you who tuned in will have heard Al covering the biology and the biochemistry of sphingolipids. And today he moves on to a related topic, which is the analytical side, particularly focusing on methods, including sample preparation, mass spectrometry, standard selection, troubleshooting, limitations, and complementary tools, and how to display sphingolipidomic data. So essential information if you want to work on, on these really important lipids. As for the last time, if you need to contact any of us during the session, just put a message under the question and answer function, but also use this function to pose questions to Al and don't wait till the end. Write questions during the talk as you think of them, so they're coming up on the screen. So Al's presentation will take around 45 minutes and there'll be 10 minutes afterwards for Al to answer questions and he'll take as many as he can at the end as time allows. So a brief recap on Al and his research. Al has researched sphingolipids for nearly 40 years. His lab and his collaborators have spearheaded our understanding of their structure and function, their metabolism, their interrelationships, and their uh, functions in health and disease. He was a director of a Lipid Maps Corps, and he's now a member of our advisory committee. Al developed the Sphingo Map, which is an expert curated pathway map of sphingolipid biochemistry. I strongly recommend you to check this out. And I'm now going to hand over to Al uh, to present this webinar, uh, part two of how to navigate the omics of sphingo and glycosphingolipidomics. Thank you, Valerie. It's a pleasure to be back for a second time to talk about this subject and go from the background information about structures and metabolism into more analytical aspects of it. When one thinks about lipidomics, there are a number of questions that pop to mind. There are others as well, but these are the ones that we've been addressing in this series. What lipids are present and how much? Where do they originate and where might they be going? How are they interrelated and how are they, are they normal or abnormal? What are their functions and are they associated with disease? The two parts we'll be talking about specifically here will deal with what lipids are present and how much, which subdivides into the topics, uh, methods for sphingolipidomic analysis from classical to mass spectrometry, <clears throat> sample preparation, the mass spectrometry itself, and then looking at the issue of uh, quantitative analysis, the selection of standards and quantitation, some complications both in identification and in quantification, and then some of the things that you want to do when you can start quantifying these molecules is uh, following uh, changes of flux and uh, use of some approaches for that, including osteotopically labeled uh, precursors and sphingolipids. So a word or two about complementary tools, and then lastly about ways of uh, displaying the data from this type of analysis. The question of what lipids are present, of course, has to begin with having a concept of what the sphingolipids are. That again was dealt with in depth before, and I've given a link to that here but also the Lipid Maps website has uh, quite a few tools to look at that, and I have some slides to remind people of that so they can go to the website and explore those tools. Among the things that you find when you do that is you can open up uh, descriptive overviews of the pathway, illustrating, <clears throat> for example, what the backbones look like and structural variation of the backbones, and uh, information about the abbreviation systems that are used, for example, for sphingoid bases, classically for the sphingoid base itself, to give the carbon number, colon number of double bonds, and then the D uh, prefix indicates whether or not it's a mono, di, or trihydroxy form of the sphingoid base. Um, for the serum, then followed by the ceramide, again, chain link number of double bonds. And this gives you examples of how one can pop up from the website and the panel on the left, the uh, structures of the uh, variants of these types of molecules and their more complex forms, going from the sphingoid bases to the ceramides to the more complex sphingolipids. 
I show on the right a small insert from one of the points I brought up in the last webinar, which is that there is considerable structural variability in the sphingoid-based backbone. One classically thinks of sphingosine, uh, the 18 carbon species with a single four or five transible bond, but there is consistently significant amounts of sphingonine. In some tissues, fairly substantial amounts of sphytosphingosine, the 4-hydroxy sphingoid base. And in other places, variants in chain link, uh, additional double bonds, uh, hydroxyl groups in other positions. And in one of the more interesting families shown down here, uh, uh, sphingoid bases that have been relatively recently discovered in mammals, where you have hydroxyl groups and hydroxymethyl groups on the end missing due to utilization of alternative uh, precursor substrate rather than serine, which gives you the terminal hydroxyl alanine or glycine. The, uh, the chain links that are typically found in the in the isolated sphingolipids of mammals vary from 14 to 36 uh, carbons in length. The 30 plus chain links mostly found in skin, but finding being found elsewhere in the body occasionally. They're mostly um, saturated or monounsaturated, in some cases polyunsaturated, however, so one needs to watch for those two. And particularly uh, when used as a uh, structural uh, lipid, they'll often have an alpha hydroxy group on the fatty acids and for skin, an omega hydroxyl group, which allows it to be uh, doubly isolated. The head groups are also complex from uh, simple groups on the first hydroxyl of a hydrogen or uh, ester linked uh, fatty acid to the uh, phosphosphingolipids, ceramide one phosphate, uh, ceramide phosphoethanolamine found in mammals in very small amount, and the major phosphosphingolipids, sphingomyelin, ceramide phosphocholine. There are also lyso versions of this, for example, sphingosine one phosphate, et cetera. And then the glycosphingolipids, uh, glucosyl ceramide, galactosyl ceramide, and more complex glycosphingolipids, which we've explored in the last to illustrate the different subfamilies that are found, where after you've made the glucosyl ceramide, you can elaborate it into these uh, root family, more complex glycosphingolipids with interesting complexity in both the linear changes, chains and the degree to which they're branched. Also, special cases of uh, sphingolipids that don't cl classically fall into those categories, but have uh, extra groups like fucose, uh, sialic acid. I also uh, point out that the, uh, the isomers are a major issue in sphingolipid uh, analysis and biological function, glucosyl versus galactosyl being the simplest and most obvious example. Uh, isomers that are due to uh, branching of chains and position of attachment of carbohydrates to each other, and whether or not the glycosidic bonds between the sugars are in the alpha or the beta position. Typically, the first sugar added to the ceramide group has been uh, associated with the beta uh, stereochemistry, and for mammalian sphingolipids, that appears true, although there's been a, a suggestion that there may be small amounts of mammalian uh, alpha glycosyl sphingolipids too. But where one mainly sees the alpha uh, sphingolipids are produced by um, microorganisms, which include intestinal microflora in an area that's become very interesting lately because these are very uh, immunologically active. Also, a point to bear in mind is that the sialic acids in glycosphingolipids in humans are in acetyl uh, sialic acids and acetyl neuraminic acid, but other organisms, other mammals even, have uh, in glycolyl uh, derivatives. And those are also sometimes found in human sphingolipids in interesting cases, such as in uh, some tumors. This gives a survey of the overall uh, glycome and the examples of how you can branch uh, off of the ceramide backbone into the different subcategories I indicated 
later, which have some representatives of uh, how many uh, variants there are beyond that. That's part of the Sphingo map story that uh, was mentioned earlier is to uh, go through there and explore them. So now thinking about it from an analytical perspective, the classic method, of course, is thin layer chromatography with detection by a variety of ways, uh, non-destructive methods such as primaline, which is partitions into the hydrophobic lipid and allows you to visualize. And then because the structure hasn't been modified, you can extract the lipid out, sometimes extract it out from mass spectrometry. Iodine vapor, which is more or less not destructive, but there is sometimes reaction of the iodine with double bonds, for example. So uh, primaline would be a safer version of uh, detection on thin layer plates. And then more aggressive uh, chemical derivatizations, but that can be useful for uh, relative quantitation. For example, cuprate sulfate and sulfuric acid that reacts with all of the species that are found on the plate. Or if you want to get ideas about what you're looking at, orsinol is a general uh, carbohydrate stain for specific uh, gangliosides, you can resource and all. So thin layer chromatography remains a powerful uh, technique for uh, looking at, for all intents and purposes, all the categories of the sphingolipids from glycosphingolipids to uh, phosphosphingolipids and ceramides and other species, uh, and sh should be borne in mind as a tool that one can used for some type of analyses. And this review by Gerald Van Acton Deckard is uh, very helpful in getting into that. Flipping now to the uh, approach we'll focus on mostly mass spectrometry, one can begin this uh, and get a lot of useful background information by going to the Lipid Maps website and bringing up these tutorial videos that were prepared by uh, Bob uh, Murphy. And in Bob Murphy's uh, video on mass spectromic approaches to lipidomic studies, he gives a nice diagram that illustrates a conceptual way of uh, subdividing this topic. And I'll use one that's very similar to it, where one uh, first deals with how you extract the lipids, then your choice of the type of uh, mass spectrometry that you're going to use, data processing, then al analysis of the data, and then how you depict the data to help an interpretation of it. My sort of rearrangement of that subject deals uh, starting with the sample over on this side and making a decision whether you're going to look at it as an extract or uh, as an in situ material, which is involved in tissue imaging mass spectrometry, which we'll uh, get to in a moment. Uh, along the uh, side that's been extracted, you can decide whether you're going to use a single extraction protocol. I'll talk about some uh, issues with that or multiple extraction protocols, which will uh, often be used for a comprehensive quantitative uh, sphingolipidomic analysis. And then various uh, types of mass spectrometry from uh, shotgun to uh, chromatography uh, based tissue imaging I referred to. And then in the types of mass spectrometry, different types of ionization uh, sources and pre-separation uh, uh, techniques like ion mobility, uh, and then the different uh, families of mass spectrometers that you could use. So this, as I say, parallels quite well what Bob talks about. So I strongly recommend that folks uh, that wanna know more about these subjects uh, go to his videos to see the different uh, expansions on this subject uh, that he makes. I will bring in several slides from his presentation because I think they're vital to what I'll be talking about as well and we'll identify those as I go through them. So first thinking about sample extraction and once you have the sample extracted, how you then redissolve it to uh, bring it into the mass spectrometer or for chromatographies. There are tremendous challenges for sphingolipids because of the structural diversity of these molecules. You have a molecule such as the deoxyceramides, ceramides in general, the omega hydroxyceramides that are extremely hydrophobic and uncharged. You have molecules that are extremely hydrophilic, such as the more complicated glycosphingolipids with six, eight, ten more uh, 
sugars attached to the ceramide backbone and molecules that are hovering in between like a sphingoid base one phosphate, uh, both a lot of uh, hydrophilicity and a lot of hydrophobicity to it. Uh, it's been pointed out if we look at the family of the deoxyceramides, uh, Felix Goni's laboratory uh, claimed that ceramide is among the least polar of uh, lipids, most hydrophobic, but these deoxy counterparts are even more hydrophobic. And again, on the other side, the uh, higher order glycosphingolipids can have 22 to 60 waters associated with the glycan moieties of that. So trying to uh, start with the biological material and dissolve molecules with such a wide range of biophysical properties is quite challenging. And as you might expect, there are because of that a, a lot of different approaches to doing it. The one that's vigorous and most comprehensive one described by Gary Van Eck and Deckert in her review article involves chloroform, methanol, water, and pyridine, and depending on the biological material, long times and high temperature. High temperature, when you think about it, uh, makes sense because a lot of the sphingolipids have very high melting temperatures. Uh, sphingomyelins, for example, have a, a phase transition temperature of 50, 60 degrees centigrade, so in a uh, biological material, it may be necessary to raise the temperature to uh, have it become disrupted from whatever aggregate it's in and become dissolved in the uh, solvent. Um, that th This is not necessarily in every case that you have to heat it and go for so long. In fact, in many cases with cells and culture and samples, it can be uh, much quicker and at lower temperatures, but it's something that definitely needs to be kept in mind. And I, doubt is often uh, done as one is looking at their extraction protocols to see if heat, which one tends to want to avoid for most things, uh, is something that should be uh, added to the analysis. A split extraction protocol that takes into account that you have molecules of such wide ranges of biophysical properties that maybe some need to be handled one way, others another way. This is a approach that we've taken and uh, method described here, which I'll come back to several times, gives that more depth. A, a very robust method using methyl terbutyl ether, methanol, and water uh, has been described and a sort of a, another approach to that of butanol methanol as a single phase extraction. And then methods that simply have nothing as their goal but to precipitate protein, which have varying degrees of uh, success in extracting the sphingolipids by that analysis. This uh, comparison at the bottom is very uh, handy because Ping et al. have looked at several of these extraction methods and find that the uh, split extraction, the MTBE, are almost identical. They favor the MTBE for a number of reasons, but you, one can go to that literature and uh, decide for yourself. Uh, Bob and Avanti, uh, Walt Shaw with Avanti, uh, before that, i uh, talked for a long time about issues whenever you're dealing with organic solvents or lipid extraction that are uh, things you need to be mindful of, uh, one of which is that there can be low levels of contaminants and solvents that can interact with lipids and form chemical variants. Uh, sometimes you even get small amounts of lipids in the uh, solvents that you buy from different suppliers. You should always use the best solvents available and you should know what uh, stabilizers are present. Uh, always use fresh solvents and w watch out for what lurks in chloroform, methylene chloride, and methanol, which I elaborate on here with diagrams from uh, modified from Bob. Chloroform breaks down the Fos gene that reacts with amino groups and other moieties to cause, uh, can potentially cause ab aberrant uh, degradation products. Uh, methylene chloride, not prone to making a phosgene like molecules, but by having been made from a chlorination of uh, methane, uh, often has residual uh, chlorine in it. And as Bob points out, it in this case is uh, desirable, even though it's an impurity in the solvent, to obtain the solvent that has a stabilizer in it because the amylene that's added in stabilized methylene chloride is able to react with the chlorine and uh, protect your samples. Methanol decomposes to formaldehyde that can react with amino groups 
so forth and so on. Um, so in uh, thinking about uh, what you're doing with these organic solvents, you, in, uh, using them to extract biological samples, the sample amount is very important. And I note here that sometimes you get more by using less sample. Uh, I'm often uh, uh, asked uh, what's the problem when a laboratory is trying to extract plasma, extract plasma to analyze sphingolipids, for example. And many times the problem is that they've used too much plasma. There's so, so much lipid in plasma that you can get by with using literally microliters uh, uh, and get better recovery uh, by doing that. The solvents used, as we've talked about, temperature, um, and then being careful about looking for the possibility of losses uh, from degradation, including whether or not you may be having a reaction with uh, surfaces. Um, an issue for sphingolipids is always uh, whether or not you use base hydrolysis. It's most often used to remove the saponifiable lipids because they are ionizing ionization suppressing for sphingolipids in many analyses, but it, one should pay attention to the fact that if you do that, you will be losing molecules such as the oasial ceramides and some of the acetylated glycosphingolipids. So this gives you an, a basic idea about then what I was talking about when I said a split uh, method, split two-phase extraction, a single phase being used for the more, more polar molecules, including the higher order glycosphingolipids would, you, would be recovered by a single phase extraction in the first step. And for uh, more nonpolar things to use uh, a, a split phase because they will partition efficiently into the organic phase. You always have to make sure that you uh, determine whether or not the extraction that you're using recovers analytes of interest. Uh, does it extract other compounds and interfere? And might something about it make later steps more difficult? The bottom line for me is typically that when one does an extraction, uh, whatever protocol you choose, to find out whether or not it's efficiently extracting all the material that's there. For example, extract the material once, take the residue from that, extract it a second time, take that residue and extract it again, and establish for yourself, say as this is an example, that what percentage of the material you're recovering in the first extract versus the second versus the third versus the fourth, introduce temperatures and all sorts of variables to determine uh, that you are indeed uh, extracting and across the board, the same sort of analysis is being shown here for the more complex lipids, coming up with what is the optimized uh, protocol for your application. You need to pay attention to the sample type is what the conditions will vary uh, with what you're analyzing, the amount, the sphingolipid subcategory, how much of the chain links are very, very long, and always be careful to periodically recheck the tubes you're using, the solvents, because that can change a lot with the lot of material you're getting and pay attention to instrument performance. Now you're getting into the mass spectrometry and you start getting data. Uh, know what you're looking at. Uh, know what you're thinking about, uh, you'll be looking for, uh, think about how they're likely to behave in the mass spectrometer, whether there's going to be ionization suppression, or isomers going to be a problem, et cetera, in deciding how you're going to approach it. To get background information about these molecules is pretty easy. Bob uh, uh, has this excellent uh, review of sphingolipid mass spectrometry lipid maps website tools and of course go to whatever the primary literature is for the method that you're following because they'll usually give you information about the mass spec behavior of the uh, analytes uh, by that methodology as you see an example here for the Shainer et al paper. This is going to be orders of magnitude more complex obviously when you start looking at the glycosphingolipids because of the multiple Sugars, sometimes it's simple. For example, a linear glycosphingolipid will chain cleave down the chain uh, fairly simply and uh, you'll get data uh, in MS-MS mode for what the uh, head groups have been and what the characteristics are of the uh, backbone. 
but you should always bear in mind that that doesn't necessarily give you the ex exact connections. That is whether or not you're looking at the hydroxyl being connected to this hydroxyl or to another position, another position, uh, alpha versus beta, and that sort of thing. You have to go to additional methodologies to be able to sort that out. As you're doing the mass spectrometry, be prepared to be surprised, discover new compounds. As one example, when we were studying uh, sphingoid bases, which have a fairly characteristic uh, cleavage fragment at 60.1 for the first and second uh, carbons and the amine and hydroxyl, we were surprised to find something that was giving us this species that lacked the hydroxyl group. And for a while, we thought it was an artifact and a in-source decomposition product, perhaps. But when it still appeared after chromatographies before um, the uh, uh, mass spectrometry, we deduced that it was actually a, the deoxysphingolipid family that I referred to earlier on. And other laboratories independently discovered these in uh, animals that had enhanced levels of them being made uh, due to uh, uh, defects in serine palmitoyl transferase. But it is fun by looking carefully at your spectra to uh, identify new compounds. Also in doing the mass spectrometry, explore the capabilities of the instrument that are being used. Cameron Sullards uh, used the uh, 4000Q trap in a way that's not standard uh, for it, in which he used the Q1 as a quadrupole to separate uh, precursor ions, but didn't use Q2 as a fragmentation chamber, basically uh, just left it with a small potential to keep the ions moving through Q2, and then uh, fed them out by uh, amplitude, varying the amplitude frequency into Q3, where it was used as a uh, to separate uh, product ions again, and uh, probably because of the uh, the decomposition of uh, sphingomyelins in the negative charge state while in Q2, got very structure uh, informative uh, fragments of the sphingomyelins, so that even though most analysis of sphingomyelin is fairly uninformative, what the backbone is because the phosphocholine head group pops off so easily. When you do this, we call it pseudo MS3 approach, um, one gets very rich background information about uh, sphingomyelin from the instrument. Also, it's interesting to think about the question of when you uh, do an analysis and you get a signal that meets all the criteria for being identified as your molecule of interest, sphingolipids in this case. Uh, how do you know there's not still something lurking in there that's uh, fooling you? An approach that we've been doing lately is to use cell lines that are defective in serine palmitoyl transferase so they don't make sphingoid bases and therefore don't make sphingolipids unless you provide them to the cell and the medium. For example, serum will do that. And then if you are uh, use the right tricks, and I'll be glad to share these tricks with anybody if they want to contact me about them, one can uh, perpetuate these cells for a long period of time in the absence of uh, sphingolipids and then do the analysis as you see here the cells without any sphingolipid supplementation or with this uh, supplementation or the wild type cells making their own sphingolipids and you see that there was a zero baseline for looking at ceramides sphingomyelins and other sphingolipids we work for so that gives us a high degree of confidence that the method that we're using is not picking up uh, things that are not sphingolipids in those channels. The fact that we eliminate the sphingolipids and we eliminate all of the background uh, signal. Other tools that are helpful for identification are indicated in Bob's uh, uh, video and as well on the Lipid Maps website. Moving now into the mass spectrometric analysis itself. There are multiple ways one can do this. I indicated earlier, uh, shotgun chromatography followed by mass spectrometry tissue imaging, sometimes categorized as untargeted approaches where you're looking at M to Z features versus targeted where you've optimized for specific compounds you're going after. 
the shotgun approach, uh, as Bob points out, has uh, a number of uh, advantages and disadvantages is where you're uh, letting all the ions come in the mass spectrometer and using the power of the mass spectrometer itself to identify molecules or features. It's easily implemented. implemented. You can get large numbers of um, molecular species. Very powerful instruments are available. As the difficulty that in many cases minor species are difficult to detect, often uh, due to ionization suppression uh, across the amounts that you're putting in uh, or overlap with uh, isomers of other uh, forms of the molecules. Uh, addict, ionized uh, salt addicts can be a problem, and there's no information that's provided uh, for species that are isomers uh, like galactosyl and glucosyl ceramide would be in that type of analysis. I've given a list that you can look at when you look at the video of this as some references to this sort of approach. Using LC beforehand has the advantages that it allows the separation of whatever type of chromatography you apply, uh, normal phase uh, liquid chromatography for polar molecules, reverse phase uh, for the separate things by their uh, hydrophobicity, uh, very powerful for resolution of uh, a double bond isomers, for example. So you can get a lot of information by having uh, optimize the LC to uh, give you uh, structural information uh, that wouldn't be gotten just from the mass uh, spectrometer. You can even use thin layer chromatography rather than LC, as I give some references later on. Um, it has the disadvantage, however, that it, it's a, a very, uh, there's a lot, it often takes a lot of time. In fact, some forms of the LC uh, can you know, take. 30, 45 minutes. Many of them can be shortened to several minute runs, but there are some times where the LC is, uh, slow, slows the process down considerably. And there are many different approaches to using LC, uh, HPLC, UPLC, the range of columns you can use, thin layer chromatography, I mentioned supercritical fluid, and then one shouldn't forget gas chromatography because uh, gas chromatography with derivatized sphingolipids is uh, still useful in some contexts. In a typical uh, LC MS MS analysis, you would typically optimize the ionization of the molecules that you're looking for so you have an idea about how you're going to approach the mass spectrometry, determine if you're going to do, say, an, a, a multiple reaction monitoring uh, protocol where you're following specific pairs of precursors and products, what are the uh, best ones to use. Then once you have that worked out, uh, then you can uh, move into identifying uh, what are the optimal LC conditions to resolve them. At that point, you have to go back and re-optimize uh, your uh, mass spectrometers because they can be altered by the way the molecules are eluding in the solvents of the uh, LC. But uh, and picking your internal standard. And with the appropriate investment of time, you can end up with a SAMP um, approach that resolves species uh, in convenient ways uh, to get the structural information, reduce ionization suppression, and have a complementary uh, bit of information of what you get just from the mass, mass spectrometry data itself. There are lots of factors to consider in choice of the uh, mass spectrometer to attach uh, to the uh, LC if that's the approach you're using, uh, or even for shotgun. Uh, for example, I've talked a lot about uh, from what we did earlier, triple quadrupole and a hybrid quadrupole ion trap instruments, and we'll provide a reference for that. And advantages are very robust, uh, good ionization uh, chemistry, and uh, recovery uh, valuable for quantitation by MRM, analyze a wide range of uh, compounds, disadvantage, not high resolution. Other types of hybrid instruments such as uh, quadrupole time of flight, uh, quadrupole orbitrap are able to give um, very high resolution spectra and are, there's a lot of movement to using these sorts of instruments for um, lipidomic studies uh, 
in general and uh, applicable to sphingolipids as well. And I give the bibliography for that. In addition, one can use Fourier transform ion synchrotron resonance as another high resolution uh, methodology. And this paper actually combines the FTICR and Orbitrap based methods for analysis. I mentioned the third category of uh, tissue imaging or imaging in general mass spectrometry. The idea there being that you're um, not losing the information of the biological sample that comes from homogenization and extraction. You're uh, gathering it in situ from typically uh, histologic slices of the material that you put on appropriate uh, plate, for example, a Maldi plate that can uh, can support a charge and then be uh, sprayed with a uh, moldy matrix material, for example, or, or not a matrix material if you're using DESI, for example, as a way to get the ions off the material, but raster across the biological material, collecting specter at each spot that you um, uh, ionize, and then that information by uh, computer um, magic uh, goes back into creating a uh, mass spectrometry image of the particular ions that you've elected to follow that can be compared to the histologic slice. Indicate advantages and disadvantages. Main disadvantages are the complications that you have in trying to uh, get ions off of a surface. But there are many uh, elegant studies about that subject, and I only throw a few in that one can uh, look at at your leisure to see how one can detect uh, interesting changes in lipids, in this particular case, ceramide, with a brain injury model, uh, identify gangliosides in different regions of the brain, et cetera. So moving to the end, where you've now collected data uh, and you're trying to think of what to do with it, uh, obviously the first step is lipid identification, and that's been done by the way I've described it so far, but of course in some uh, say shotgun methodologies or untargeted methodologies that, where you have uh, features that you've been following, you may still need to now identify them. Then to quantify if that was one of the goals of the analysis and then what sort of tools to use in data analysis, uh, mathematical uh, and visualization tools. This is a, a area where Bob points out in this video is where that can be sometimes one of the most challenging and also where some egregious errors can occur if one doesn't do it thoughtfully and uh, with the best possible materials. And he talks about this in great detail, so I refer you back again to his video on the Lipid Maps website for uh, some information. But some of the things that he points out in his video is that in quantifying, you can the most rigorous approach, of course, is so-called absolute quantitation as a theoretical goal uh, for a perfect study, but uh, it, it's very difficult to do and therefore not very often done. So what one typically does is relative quantification, just relative changes or uh, quantifying against a standard that you've added that is not a perfect standard, meaning a stable isotope uh, that uh, behaves identically to the analyte of interest and lists some of the uh, features that are uh, advantageous of taking that approach. The bottom line of it is that the signal that you're getting is going to be a function of the amount of a lipid that's present. Things that are related to the ionization uh, chemistry for the molecule that you're looking at, the extent to which that's interfered with by interfering lipids and whatever instrument factors that are their type of instrumentation, how well it's tuned, how clean the instrument is. But once you work as best as you can to optimize all those features, then you can use for most rigorous quantitation, a stable isotope internal standard, or if you, uh, and you can't for lipidomics because they've evolved too many. You can use a, uh, a selected uh, representative for class uh, uh, internal standard that you would compare to, which is what one normally does for uh, sphingolipid 
analysis. A cocktail, for example, might have a sphingoid base, sphingoid base phosphate. Ceramides often two chain links at least are useful because the longer chain links tend to aggregate and you wanna watch for that, et cetera. And as you notice here from this paper I cite, you can get very high degrees of linearity and even uh, optimized mass spec parameters so that you get signals that are almost identical even with the different chain link variants for the families of molecules that are there. Other issues that are uh, related to this are um, varying the internal standards so that its amount mimics what the biological material is. The cocktail I showed you before had every internal standard at the same amount, but lipids vary over orders of magnitude in amount in many biological materials. So in a perfect world, you would match the internal standard to the analyte amount as closely as possible and other considerations summarized here. Again, it, one thing you always have to worry about are uh, isomers. Uh, if you look, have looked at sphingomyelins only by following the head group loss, you'll have a series of uh, isomeric backbone species. We were able to distinguish these because we used the method I described a minute ago for, for the sphingoid base in acyl chain. All of these add up to the same number. So if you're just looking at phosphocholine loss, you'll be calling that a material of a certain amount, but in fact, it's divided up into multiple uh, individual species. Uh, interestingly, uh, I, I'm inter always uh, amazed by how uh, prescient some early chemists are. J.L.W. Tudicum, in describing sphingolipids in 1884, had already talked about one of the most uh, unforeseen complications was the occurrence of chemical principles having the same atomic or elementary composition, but differing in other chemical and physical properties, the varieties in the phenomenon in chemistry termed isomerism. So this is a feature that's been known for a long time. One other challenge in uh, quantifying is uh, harmonizing the results across multiple laboratories. And this is a subject that is very hot now in the lipidomic field in general and sphingolipidomics together with it. And I provide as part of this video uh, some references to uh, studies that have been look, looking at harmonization and analysis. Uh, and this includes that this is an issue across lipid categories, but also within lipid categories, including the sphingolipid uh, categories and reference for that. And then uh, there are initiatives uh, now being made, uh, early stages of them, uh, to try to resolve this. And this particular website uh, gives one group that's trying to get a conversation going on that, that Lipid Maps is participating in to try to let quantification extend across laboratories. It, it's even challenging within a laboratory to, to do it, but it's even more challenging across. Moving into uh, other approaches to looking at sphingolipids and particularly the dynamics sometimes, using uh, precursors like isotopically labeled precursors to detect differences, indicate shifts in metabolite, metabolite flux when possible. There are multiple sites in the sphingolipid pathway where you can do that. Precursors for the backbone, analogs or isotopically uh, labeled forms of the intermediates, head groups. There, these I provide uh, that one can read at your leisure, some uh, references to that. Some of the challenges are pretty obvious. One, for example, if you're using serine, is that serine is involved in multiple metabolic pathways, so nailing down its specific activity is tough. Furthermore, for the sphingolipid biosynthetic pathway, some of the metabolites produced from serine are themselves able to be uh, precursors for sphingoid bases. Thinking about labeling via the fatty acid, for example, a C13 labeled fatty acid, that's a very uh, powerful technique because you can get labeling of the backbone, labeling of the N-acyl chain, and then 
end up with basically four different categories, a doubly labeled species, the unlabeled species, and partially labeled that can be inferred to sometimes be an indicator of uh, whether or not you're using a salvaged backbone for this sort of species, or everything is from de novo. But the complication there is that the, and an advantage also of that is that you can follow with that sort of molecule uh, other fatty acids that are made, the chain elongated fatty acids for the very long chain uh, sphingolipids. But a, a tough complication is that you also don't get a very high specific activity of the fatty acid uh, inside the cells. So the C13 labeled fatty acid added is diluted by endogenous fatty acids. And we have a paper cited here that looks at that in some depth. One approach to that might be to use, to use earlier precursors like acetate and do an isotopomer analysis. And also that sphingolipid turnover gives the fatty acid back. So as you synthesize from palmitoyl CoA to make the backbone and it's degraded, it comes back to palmitoyl CoA. So depending on what the time course is and so forth, you have the possibility of a label being incorporated, turned over back, and reincorporated. At some point, people will be able to look at that and, and study it in depth, but it's but, uh, and understand it. But for now, difficult. So basically, to detect differences, stable isotopes give you are relatively easily used to indicate shifts in metabolites. It's a somewhat easy approach. To determine rigorous metabolic flux, it's a good deal more complicated. I give a list of some tools that are available that are complementary to what I've talked about so far. Uh, they include tools that are completely complementary, like thin layer chromatography with immunoblotting rather than other types of detection, glycan uh, microarrays, but also some techniques that are used adjunct with mass spectrometry. And you're welcome to breeze through, uh, browse through those and, and see how uh, they could be useful in a particular application that you might have. For example, click chemistry and all of its power. What we close with, I apologize for running a few minutes longer than I intended, but I hope you'll bear with me, is there are multiple ways, of course, of the, the putting out the data, heat maps, nodal maps, uh, to, to visualize what you have, Pathway maps, I think, are going to be one of the ultimate ways to do this so that you uh, download the data into a program. There are some that are fairly old. Lipid maps are working on some newer versions of these. And you can reflect what your, is changing in a combination metabolite heat map type format and combine that with genomic data so that you have both lipidomic and genomic data side by side, visualizable and able to interpret the results from that sort of thing. And as I indicated in my last webinar, when one starts thinking about the sphingolipid pathway, you end up with a, a fairly interesting uh, geometric representation of moving through the pathway, having multiple nodal branch points. And at some point, I think that kind of representation, uh, probably with artificial intelligence, uh, uh, computation to interpret it will be valuable for um, uh, truly understanding the data you get from a lipidome analysis. So thank you very much for listening to this uh, shotgun approach through the analytical techniques. Uh, I hope that by making uh, uh, the bibliography available to you and some fine points that are indicated on the slides that if you want to go back and peruse, uh, it'll serve as a uh, fairly broad but also deep overview of of this subject. So thank you again, and now I'll open up to see what uh, exists in the question and answer queue. So uh, Al, while you are opening up the questions, I've got one quick question sure. for you, and that is obviously the number of these lipids is phenomenal, and uh, you know it's increased hugely over the last number of years. Do you think that most mammalian sphingolipids are now discovered, or are there still loads more to find, and is it, is it mainly non-mammalian? ones that are now being found? You know, where do you see this going? Yeah, I think that the, the, there are two challenges for the mammalian. One is that the, uh, for m most of the glycosphingolipids, there are uh, gaps in the pathway. 
So the sphingo map that we created uh, has uh, annotated on it molecules that we found in the literature. It's not completely up to date, but it, uh, they're indicated by bold li lines around them. And then dashed species, which are hypothetical intermediates between them that so far we haven't seen in the literature. And th sometimes there are multiple ways you can get the, to, uh, the, m the ones that are known. So we've uh, put in uh, some alternatives with the idea that as more study is done of the exact order in which things are made, then one would uh, tidy that up. Uh, so there are still quite a few uh, of the most complex molecules where the steps between are waiting to be elucidated. Uh, that and the other side of it is that not much has been done in uh, looking at the diversity of the sphingoid base and ceramide and so forth backbones. The most work that's done with sphingolipids are done looking for sphingosine, uh, sphingonine, phytosphingosine. <clears throat> Very little with the chain link variants. Uh, Ashley Coward, for example, has done a lot with the D16 uh, sphingoid base and binding uh, organs where it's uh, enriched and that that seemed to be involved in physiologic regulation there and uh, so forth and so on. So the, uh, the, the methods that have been uh, looked at have tended to go after the major species and not pay much attention to the minor ones. <clears throat> and assuming the minor ones have uh, biological activities and functions, this could be like if you were to say arachidonic acid is known and is a major molecule uh, what's all that trace stuff <laughs> that comes from it? Uh, does it have a biological function? Of course it does, in all the acosinoid fields. Um, and then the partner to that is the um, molecules that are, we consume in the diet that haven't been uh, looked at enough. Plant sphingoid bases have double bonds in different uh, position uh, some, uh, than mammals. For example, the double bond at position eight is put in before uh, the delta four position. So you can get a delta eight unsaturated sphingoid base from plants or the four eight and others like that. So uh, little- so there's, still, uh, there's still an awful lot to do by the sounds of it. It just goes on and on and on and there'll be discovery right. of these lipids for many more decades. So thanks for that. But should we switch to some of the questions? And I'm just looking at Corinne Zemsky Berry's question here. Would you like to take that one? So she asks, and I guess that's Corinne a, that's is- That's why I made the entreaty to uh, <laughs> keep your eyes open so that anytime people do these analyses and they find things that um, they weren't expecting, that yeah. if they have the opportunity, they pursue them because it might be the opening for discovery. Of field, yeah. So Corinne's asking what criteria should be used to validate an LCMSMS method for sphingolipids? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Corinne, Corinne is asking you what criteria should be used to validate an LCMSMS method for sphingolipids. Um, I mean, typically it's the kind that I uh, indicated but went over it very quickly, which is that the, um, if you have enough information from the standards to know the behavior that you're looking for, and then you make it redundant in uh, the, uh, but, but different in the biophysics of the approaches that you use. For example, a reverse phase chroma, it, we will often do say a normal phase uh, LCMS uh, for uh, say uh, hexacyl ceramides. And then uh, we will split that up into uh, normal phase silica based separation of galactosyl and glucosyls, and then one can uh, use that or a hillock type methodology to resolve them uh, further into alpha and beta. Uh, Roger Sandhoff developed some nice methodologies to be able to do that. And then equivalently looking at the backbones. So it, it's, uh, it's there, there's not an easy way to do it at this particular time. So what probably one has to make a choice of in your analysis is uh, how hard you want to look at, at the data after you've done the initial run 
to go through and figure out uh, uh, what is really going on. The simple case is you are comparing two things and you see something that's really big and something that's small. And so you've already got a motivation to figure out what's inside there. Uh, and you can do this secondary methodologies to figure that out. Uh, the more problematic case is where you don't see a change or you see a small change and you're inferring that probably nothing is happening. But if you broke that up into the sub components, you would discover that really interesting stuff is actually going on. You just didn't have the resolution power to see it in your first run. This very often happens with hexacyl ceramides where you, you measure hexacyl ceramides, glucosyl ceramides um, go down and galactosyl ceramides come up and you don't know it because you, you're getting more or less no change in the monohexacyl ceramide pool. That case is particularly interesting because when I talked about the pathway uh, last webinar, I pointed out that galactosyl ceramide is made in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and glucosyl ceramide in the Golgi. So if you have a change in ER to Golgi trafficking, which can happen, for example, in ER stress, so that the uh, ceramide is retained longer in the uh, ER, then galactosyl ceramides can go up and glucosyl ceramides can go down. And there's really interesting uh, biochemistry taking place, but it wouldn't show up in an analysis of just uh, monohexacyl ceramides. Okay, so um, thanks for that. So I think maybe time for one more question. Chris asks, are sphingolipids the only lipid group that are glycosylated? Uh, I'm sorry, Valerie. Uh, oh, sorry. I, 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 I'll explain, Valerie, that, that to the uh, people listening that I have a head uh, allergies this morning, <laughs> so I, I, I'm having a I have a, my hard time hearing anything. But so, oh, sorry uh, to hear that. So, are sphingolipids the only lipid group that are glycosylated? No, there are. Uh, there's a, a, a glycosyl uh, cholesterol. And and uh, uh, diglyceride uh, uh, glycosylated lipids. Uh, uh, Yoshi Hirabayashi has been studying those uh, in considerable depth. And uh, uh, if you look up his uh, papers, you'll see an interesting evolving story about um, in uh, mammals there being. Uh, other forms of, uh, and of course, phosphatidyl inositols are uh, also a, a category of uh, sugar type head group. Uh, so there, it, it goes across all uh, the, the, the three lipid categories, uh, sterols, uh, glycerol lipids, but obviously most extensive for sphingolipids in mammals. And then you go to other organisms and a, a wide, multiple cases of uh, glycans attached to other types of uh, backbones. Okay, thanks. So, and one very last one, because I think this hopefully will be a short one. With an MTB extraction and a modern triple quad, what volume of plasma would you recommend to extract? I guess that really depends on which of the subcategories of sphingolipids you're looking for, but, but as a kind of broad answer to that, what would you suggest? Sure. Well, of course, that uh, it, that's not the technique I've done the most myself. We've done the two phase method. Uh, also, it depends on the instrument and uh, so forth uh, and what you're bringing the material up at the end, the volume. But the short and the long of it is that um, we rarely need to extract more than uh, 10 to 20 microliters of uh, plasma to be able to get um, all the data that we want out of the sample. And if we go uh, higher than that for, uh, this is using chloroform and methanol, but it's not that much different uh, the, for a few milliliters of uh, a solvent. If we go higher than that, you start seeing a drop off of the recovery. So, uh, you know, I'll often see people using 100 microliters, a half mil, a milliliter, uh, probably going higher and higher in amount, thinking that they're having difficulty seeing minor analytes, <laughs> but in fact, the signal often goes down uh, as you go to the higher volume. So I would say you have to 
do this empirically on your own, but don't be afraid to keep going lower uh, to try to enhance your signal because you'd sometimes be surprised. Yeah, really important point. I think that's a good point for us to finish because it's just coming up to six o'clock now. So uh, I really, first of all, want to thank Al really hugely for these last, these two fantastic webinars. Uh, you know, this is an area that I don't personally know an awful lot about, sphingolipids, and I've learned a huge amount. And I think that there's information here both for the newbies to this and to the old hats at working with sphingolipids, an extensive bibliography, which will be undoubtedly hugely useful to people. So thank you for that. And also thanks to Dawn and Caroline for uh, their expert technical support with this for the last two sessions. And I really just want to finish by uh, advertising our upcoming webinars. So next up on December the 10th, we have Ed Dennis talking about our cousinoids. Uh, and then we're going to have Bob Murphy on February 25th, who's going to be covering phospholipids and glycerides. Bill Griffiths is next up then on April 28th, talking about sterols and sterol esters. And then finally, in this series right now, we've got Michael Wakelam in June um, talking about phosphonosatides. I'm guessing uh, beyond that, we are going to be every two months um, timetabling in uh, new speakers. And our, uh, kind of, uh, our ethos right now is to cover the major phospholipid categories and subcategories. Once we've worked our way through all of those, we will be onto new, uh, new formats and, and maybe some, some research presentations and some some sort of uh, research talks and things so anyway thanks very much for attending today um, th this will be going on to youtube in the next day or two and uh, we hope that anyone who's missed it today will be able to catch it there and if you've had questions that haven't been answered please feel free to email al he would be delighted to hear from you thank you very much goodbye thank you